Growing up in the 1970s, my parents hired a maid. This was a common thing. Becky had been with the family since the early 1960s. She worked for my grandparents as well. I'd often see my grandfather waiting for Becky at the corner bus stop when I was riding to school in the morning. Becky was truly part of our family. She worked for my grandparents two days a week and for us two days a week. I was always a little jealous of her third family, where she worked that other day. I didn't know them, but felt like Becky belonged to me. My name is Rebecca. I was supposed to be called Becky, but when our Becky came to work for us, it would have been too confusing, so I was always Rebecca. Becky was a kind, gentle soul. She always put candy under our pillows. She cleaned our rooms, and if she found coins or money in our clothes, she'd iron the bills and stack the coins in a neat pile on our dresser. At Christmas time, she gave my sisters and I gifts. She was so sweet and thoughtful. She loved us. Becky and her adult nieces Linda and Sylvia babysat us when my parents were on vacation. I was interested to see where Becky lived, and one day my mother took us downtown to her apartment. It was nice, a place where elderly people lived, a safe building. She lived up high, maybe on the 10th floor. What struck me was she had every single school photo of me and my two sisters framed and hanging on the wall, like 20 or so school pictures of these white kids from the suburbs. We really were her family. My parents separated when I was 14, almost 15. My mother was absolutely despondent. She cried all the time. Becky, obviously concerned for my sisters and I, confided to us that her husband had left her many years prior. She identified with my mother. Becky took care of my mother, comforting her. It must have been hard for Becky to see our family dissolve this way. My grandfather, the one at the bus stop, had died the previous fall, and we were still in mourning over that. My mom's mom had died the previous August, so my mother was in a really bad state of mind. Becky was our rock, someone who arrived twice a week to keep our home running. Then, the unthinkable happened. In the summer of 1980, we returned home from summer camp. My mother told my sister to tell Becky that lunch was ready. My little sister, who was 11 at the time, came into the kitchen and said, Becky is asleep with her eyes open. My mom and I just shot each other a knowing look. My mom ran downstairs to Becky while I dialed zero. There was no 911 at the time. The paramedics took her to a hospital. She died later that day from a stroke. We weren't allowed to see her in the hospital. We followed the ambulance because we weren't family. But yes, we were. Becky spent more time with us than her real family. I saw her daughter and a few other family members behind the glass. That was as close as we were allowed to her room. She was really brain dead by the time she went to the hospital. I saw the paramedics try to revive her in our family room. She basically died in our home. Why this long story, you ask? I want you to have some background. My mom finally started going out trying to meet men. One night out of every weekend, I had to babysit my little sister. My older sister had moved out at 18. I wasn't happy about this because I was in high school and I wanted to be with my friends. While I was babysitting, I'd hear noises upstairs. I'd run upstairs, our dog would be asleep on the sofa, and my little sister was fast asleep in her bed, but I swore I heard footsteps. This kept happening, and I tell my mother, but she didn't believe me. My mother and father reconciled briefly. He moved back in. I wasn't happy about it. He'd hurt my mother by cheating on her. One night, while my dad was there, I heard this weird wailing. I thought it was the neighborhood fox who routinely wailed at the moon, or was crying for its pups or whatever, but this sound was closer. I thought maybe the fox was on the other side of the house by the woods. As I tried to lift up my roller blind, I could hear this wailing. It was coming from above my head. 
the attic. I got in bed, too afraid to tell my skeptical mother. I knew she wouldn't believe me. At breakfast, my dad said, Did anyone else hear that weird noise last night? I said, Yes. I wasn't crazy. There was a weird noise. My dad said it was coming from the attic. He set animal traps up there, but there weren't any animals in the attic. Then my dad and my mom split up for good. I'd still hear the footsteps when I was alone in the house. Years went by. I moved out and got married. In 1992, I separated from my husband and moved in with my mother. My mother went to Florida for the winter, and I was alone in the house. I started dating. One day, in the family room downstairs, my boyfriend said, What in the heck is that? He heard footsteps. I was immune to them at this point. I said, I think it's Becky. She died in this house. She loved us. If it is her, she's here to watch over us. A couple of weeks went by. My boyfriend and I were in the living room having a romantic date by the fire. The lights were off. There was just the light of the fire. He went upstairs to use the bathroom. He came out of the bathroom and I looked up the stairs. He just stood there frozen, with his eyes bugging out. I thought he was drunk. I said, What's the matter? Didn't you see that? He replied. What? I asked. A woman in a pink sweater just walked by you, he said. I quickly looked around, but I didn't see anything. But I knew it was Becky. I'd never told my boyfriend that Becky wore a white maid's uniform and a pink cardigan. She wore that pink cardigan all the time. I called my mother, and she finally believed me. I forgot to mention, my father, grandmother, and sisters went to Becky's funeral. My mother didn't go. She was angry with my father at the time, I guess. Everyone there was under the impression that I was named after Becky. In truth, my mother told me she named me Becky after Becky Thatcher from Tom Sawyer, but I let Becky's family believe that I was named after her. It made them happy. They told me how much Becky loved us. I already knew that. But it was so nice to hear. Hey guys, I'm gonna give the next story a trigger warning for domestic violence. Though it's a work of fiction, please skip to the next story if needed. When my husband first hit me, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't even hurt at least not in the physical sense. I'd been expecting it for a while. Every time a muscle in his jaw twitched or his breathing shallowed, a short fuse ready to explode. At first it was words murmured under his breath, a disapproving shake of his head. Then it was the frustration, along with an impatience reserved for children who don't know better, or an untrained pet. The way he spoke to me slowly became more and more hateful, his vile words often puncturing me like knives. The worst came when he was drunk, which was pretty often, but he wasn't half as brave when he was hungover. He never apologized, instead blaming his bad temper on work-related stress, saying I only added to it. Basically, he was a poor fucking excuse for a man. The first time he actually swung his fist, he punched a hole in our wall, all because I accidentally bought the wrong kind of beer. For days, the hole stayed untouched, wide like a yawning mouth. Every time I looked at it, I knew that I was next in line. As for the beer, he still drank all of it. At one point, he even tasked me to patch up the hole, either by my own hand or with my own money. The vase flew by my head when I called him crazy. I learned after that not to talk back, even if it didn't change anything. Not long after, when my husband's fist got tired of plastering glass, my flesh sufficed. In a way, I was almost offended 
how he didn't consider me first even for this, always on the back burner, the toy forgotten in the back of the dresser, the ghost that watched things unfold for everyone else. But you know what the worst part is? I couldn't leave him. See, when I married him, I didn't do it out of love. I did it out of a need so great that it was almost a tangible thing, threatening to consume me. I was young and very poor, desperate to get out of my parents' shabby little house. They wouldn't miss me anyways. I was one of seven kids they couldn't feed and much less care for. They probably didn't even remember me. Frank, my husband, was a little older than me, a college dropout that had a job as a mechanic. He wasn't ugly, not necessarily, but girls weren't throwing themselves at him either. He had a bit of a mean face too, with dark, flat eyes and early onset wrinkles from frowning so much. He was a good kisser though, I'll give him that. We met after my father almost totaled his old pickup truck, bringing it in for repairs he really couldn't afford. In Frank, I saw an opportunity and my need overpowered any feelings of warning. We both just settled for each other, unconsciously knowing there wouldn't be anything better in our shitty little town. We got married as soon as I graduated high school, moving in together soon after. Our wedding was about as romantic as you'd expect, small town chapel with all the guests sitting on the groom's side, his lips tasted like greasy gas station taquitos when we kissed to seal the ceremony. I got a job waitressing and also helped stock at the supermarket a couple times a week. We were definitely struggling, but our crammed apartment was infinitely better than my childhood home. The days began to blend into each other, turning into months and then years. Those first few years weren't so bad. They were monotonous, yes, but at least we mostly stayed out of each other's ways and focused on making enough to pay our bills. He was a heavy drinker, like my father, and his party days never really seemed to end. Most nights, he was too drunk to do anything but yell and pass out, with me cleaning up the mess behind him. Things went to shit when we found out I couldn't have children. We, and when I say we, I mean just him, had been trying out for a while with no luck, and a trip to the doctor brought us clarity. It was out of my control, obviously, and while I was a little sad, I was also infinitely thankful. It was a blessing in disguise. To him, his news was only a curse. He made sure to always remind me that I was a defective woman, that it had been a mistake to marry me that he had lost his prime years being with me, blah blah blah. He was fucking insufferable. But I did nothing and said nothing when he started fucking younger girls. At least he'd left me alone when it comes to, well, that. I can't lie and say that I hadn't dreamed of having a daughter one day. Perhaps if I wound up somewhere much better in life, with a stable job that paid me well enough, and the unshakable courage to stand up for myself. I'd run away with my daughter and be the parent I desperately needed as a child. I would have named her Cassie, and it would have been us against the world. I was stupid enough to dare to hope. I knew that to bear his child and bring it into this world would be condemning it to a life of suffering. I would never forgive myself for it. I cried often when he wasn't home, but after a while, I ran out of tears. Life had never been lonelier. You may think I'm a coward, but I don't really care. I don't think I need to reiterate that I couldn't afford a fucking divorce, and going to bed with bruises was better than sleeping in alleyways reeking of piss. I still had some sense of self-worth. Still, I had my own way of dealing with things. My own dirty little secret. During the day, I was the perfect wife, placid and quiet and always of service. I packed his lunch in the mornings, along with extra strong coffee to nurse his hangovers. I kept the house impeccable, paid bills on time, and learned how to cover up the evidence of his violence on my body. 
and I had deep, teeth-shaped grooves on my wrists from holding in my screams, so I always wore long sleeves. I learned early on that making any sort of noise would only make things worse for me. Nobody suspected a thing, perhaps because they didn't care to look too closely. At night, as I lay awake in bed, I thought of carnage. All the violent ways I wanted payback, be it by my hand or not. In reality, I could never actually bring myself to get physical like that. I hadn't thought it possible for me to even conjure such scenarios. But years of repressed anger and hatred can really bring out the worst in a person. It all had to go somewhere. These thoughts followed me into dreams where my imagination ran free. I dreamt of graceful arcs of blood spurting out of his jugular, staining our eggshell walls. How his large intestine would spool out of his sliced abdomen like unused yarn, snapping one of his rib bones to pick the meat off my teeth. And suddenly, I wasn't myself in those dreams. There was a creature, one so like me, yet so different at the same time. At first, it was hard for me to discern its features, but it became clearer with every night that passed. It had my hair, a dirty blonde that I always hated, but it was matted and falling off in chunks, exposing bald craters. It had no eyes, no nose or ears, but the mouth took up most of the space needed for those, jutting out like an animal's maw. It was long and spindly, and when I dreamt of it crawling atop my husband, it reminded me of an arachnid closing in on a fly. It was a beautiful nightmare. The sight of it felt familiar too, like it had always been there. An extension of my flesh that had been waiting for me to unearth it at the right time. A projection of the unfathomable strength and brutality I wish I possessed during the daytime. So, naturally, I latched onto it, addicted to the nocturnal rush of adrenaline. Nobody could take this carnage away from me. I began to wake up feeling more refreshed, more alive than I'd ever been, like I'd been practicing lots of self-care and catching up on years worth of rest. I was sleeping a lot better, drifting through my day with ease and a syrupy sweet smile plastered on my face. Someone at work even told me I was glowing, asking if I was pregnant, to which I bluntly responded with, I'm infertile. He didn't think it was funny, but the look on his face was priceless. Not that I cared what he or anyone else thought of me for that matter. Making friends wasn't really a priority, given that I was on survival mode 24-7. The crazy thing is, I did feel like I wasn't alone anymore. There was an overwhelming sense of peace that had suddenly flooded me, and at the very back of my mind, there was a reassuring voice that I couldn't quite hear, but still understood. The beast fed off of my hatred and rage, deepening my thirst for revenge. At times, I thought perhaps I was losing it, but would that really be so terrible? I would have welcomed living in muddled reality where I had the upper hand. For two weeks, my husband even kept his hands off of me. He avoided me at all costs instead of berating me for every little thing. He slept away instead of bringing girls to the house. The bruises on my body were healing, turning a soft yellow and red against my pale skin. Things seemed to be okay for once. That was until the night one of his many skanks fed him some new drug, an amphetamine of sorts, and he came home cross-eyed and drooling like an animal. It was the middle of the night when he barged into our room, bellowing some nonsense that my barely awake mind couldn't comprehend. At the moment, I thought it more annoying than frightening. I got up and tried to coax him into calming down to get into the bed and get some sleep, but he wouldn't listen. 
He swung his big, beefy arms as I tried to reach for him, smacking me across the face in the process. His pupils were wide and dark, swallowing his irises in a vortex of nothingness. His breath alone could light a raging fire with a single spark. If only I had thought to get a lighter or a box of matches. What more poetic way to go than by the cleansing of flame? For the first time in all our time together, I thought enough. In a blind act of bravery, I shoved him and he lost his balance, falling onto the mirror that hung on the door and shattering it. When his mind registered what I'd just done, he looked at me with an animalistic rage. He didn't even seem to notice his arm was bleeding, full of tiny cuts. We were both tense, our bodies coiled like springs about to snap. I felt powerful in that moment, but it was a feeling that quickly died down. He was the first to move, and he was so fast that I was barely able to react. From one second to the next, he was holding a shard of glass and advancing on me. Once more, he had all control over me, snatching all the power I felt for even a fraction of a second. He swung wildly, screaming, I'm going to kill you, all while I scurried back quickly, barely out of reach of the shard. In my haste, I tripped over a pillow and fell backwards for what felt like an eternity. Time slowed down until suddenly there was a sickening crack at the back of my skull. Then there was only darkness. I had been snuffed out from existence in an instant, quietly, without so much as a gasp. Or so I thought. I wasn't sure how long I was passed out for, but I woke up to a squelch and the acrid, coppery smell of blood. My vision swam, and I lay there on the floor as I tried to blink away the splitting headache. A movement on the bed caught my eye, and I stared hard, trying to make out what I was seeing. A long, thin arm sliced through the air, sharpening into a right angle as a bloody hand gripped the lower edge of the bed frame. My eyes followed the pale flesh, and I saw a flash of pink stained teeth, long and thin as fingers. On the walls, large crimson Rorschach stains. The image was so familiar that I thought for a moment I was in a dream again, though a more vivid one. The pain grounded me, as did the memory of what had caused me to pass out. Breathing mechanically, I found some strength within me and slowly sat up. There was more blood under me, and the back of my head felt slick and warm. I placed a hand down to keep myself upright, but instead of feeling the wooden floor, there was something tough and sinewy. The bed creaked, and I looked up, my mind unable to process what was in front of me. The creature from my dreams smiled, which looked weird given its elongated mouth. It was covered in blood and gore, but seemed intact. It had my husband pinned underneath its body, one long hand pressed against his cheek. He was unconscious, bruised and battered with a couple of bites here and there. Beside the creature, something long uncoiled off the side of the bed and snaked on the floor, underneath my hand and still going. It was a sickening white, pale blue and purple in color. One end seemed to be connected to the creature's stomach, while the other... Instinctively, I reached a hand up towards the back of my head, where the edge of my nightstand hit my skull. The other end was firmly attached to the nape of my neck, going into a small, fleshy crater that should have been my demise. That's when it hit me an umbilical cord. The creature had freed itself from the dark womb of my unconscious mind out into reality. My dreams were the gestation, every night the creature growing stronger. I nourished it, fed it, and even came to love it. I was a mother, despite what I'd been told. I was not broken, or useless, or any kind of things my husband called me. I was the one in control of my life 
and my body. I moved, and the creature followed. I raised a hand, and it did the same. It mirrored me, like a child learning a parent's mannerisms, despite the fact that it had no eyes to see me. Love is blind, or so they say. I knew this creature would do anything for me, and I for it. The creature helped me up and steadied me on my feet. Underneath, my husband groaned a little, yet remained unconscious. Both of us looked down at my husband's prone body, detached, the hindrance that stood between us and the life we wanted. Oh, how glorious it would be. Now that we had each other, the next step was to get rid of the obstacle. Hours later, there was no more Frank, at least nothing discernible. We reenacted so many of those violent fantasies, but as much as I wanted to hear him scream, we couldn't alert the neighbors. His vocal cords were severed first, but the look of abject, mute horror and agony on his face was worth it. We left before morning came, catching a brand new day to start a new life. We needed sustenance for the road, so we ate and we drank as much as we could. By the time they found his bones, they would be bleached by the sun, based on the bed pathetically, if not a little melancholic. I made sure no one would come looking for a while. It was a fair trade after all. One man's nightmare being a woman's dream. It's what I deserve. I'd like to begin by describing myself, because I believe it's relevant to the story. I have to assume that I'm not the average author here. I'm 25, male, and a bit above average height. I've been doing sports five to six times a week since I've graduated high school. Gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sport my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I've just recently purchased a new pair of high-altitude mountaineering boots because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that's surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break in my summer boots last Saturday, more specifically because it would have been my grandfather's birthday and he also loved to hike before he died. These boots are overkill for these woods, but I needed to try them. I selected a nice route that's around 25 kilometers and set off at about 9 in the morning. It rained just the day before, so I expected a fair amount of mud and not so many people, as they are easily scared off by the weather. Since the summer was excruciatingly hot, it was a nice change of temperature, especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not-so-distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike. But she's turning 14 this year, and she doesn't enjoy long-distance walks anymore. My girlfriend had to do something for work on short notice, so I knew from the moment I woke up, I would be doing the hike alone. The first half of the hike was perfect, the altitude difference along the trail is minimal. I barely broke a sweat, and I misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met at most six to seven people during the first two to three hours, and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animals' tracks. There are deer and wild boars in these woods, Nothing more menacing, not animals anyway, but I won't get ahead of myself. Between 12 and 1, the path ran into an actual road, one where cars can go. 
This road is asphalt, but deep in the forest, and can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go here. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred meters. As I was walking along the road, I heard a car approach from behind me. It went past me, not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older, green SUV with a fresh registration. You can tell by the license plate, probably an import. Anyway, I thought nothing of it at the time. Then I heard it drive back. It drove past me for the second time, now very slowly, and I could clearly see two men sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had a stubble slash beard game going on as well. I assumed they were gamekeepers, even though those cars have a crest on the hood and on both front doors. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things. I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this. They have jeeps which are more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort, and again, I thought nothing of it. Then, my trail left the asphalt road and began snaking in the woods again. I walked ahead serenely, gazing at trees and whatnot. Then, I suddenly had the strange sensation that something or someone was behind me. An engine sound was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point, the trail was quite narrow. But if, for whatever reason, you'd want to drive a car on it, you could, just about. Now, when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically in my face. It was an arm's length away from me, and it stopped just as I had. I looked at the driver, who was staring back, as I can only assume as he was wearing sunglasses. I calmly asked him, What's wrong? Shall I let you go? In a polite tone as his window was rolled down, he didn't speak. He slowly started reversing and he soon disappeared behind a curve. Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that he was alone in the car, unlike earlier. I listened intently, standing still, since I wasn't sure what was going on. At this point, I was not scared, but there was a faint feeling of unease in the air, and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car, and the engine stop just behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but nothing from that point on. I turned around and began walking towards my destination at a much faster pace than before. Now I was a bit scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer and why he just reversed and left without a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it and I had no desire to ask him again or to see him again for that matter. I had just walked enough for these unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water as I usually do, I decided to take a piss. I saw a perfect spot, a very narrow path off my trail that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder that led up to it, and then began pissing. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I also had a sip of water. I'd been standing there for a good few minutes before I headed back to the trail from where I deviated to take a leak. Right before I arrived back to the main trail, I thought to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind, no noise of any kind absolutely nothing. This made me realize, just a moment later, how alone I was, except for the man who was standing maybe 50 meters away from me on the trail, in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back on that trail, since the small one to the tower was well hidden by trees, and you couldn't see the main trail as it was running perpendicularly to the small one. I looked at him, and I was instantly chilled to the bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing, with a baseball hat on his head. The only reason he was standing still 
I believe, was a moment of surprise that I had appeared from a place where he didn't expect me to appear from. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident with the SUV, I would have probably walked along the trail, thinking he's a hunter. However, in light of the strange encounter with the SUV, from which the second man was missing, something in me snapped instantly. In hindsight, it's also illegal to hunt in these woods this time of year. I figured, in the matter of two seconds, that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion towards and past the tower, as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf, or the others, he'll just think I'm an idiot and forget about me in two minutes. If I'm right, it's the best call I will have ever made. And for fuck's sake, he began running towards me, adrenaline blossoming within me. I began sprinting away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees, and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was exhausted. It must have been several kilometers. I even crossed some smaller trails, but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was a billion the whole time. I began checking my phone for signal, but nothing. I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate. After a while, I began power walking, but still off trail, straight ahead, in a direction that I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone got signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me seriously. They said I was overreacting and whatnot, saying, you must have misunderstood the situation. Well, I'll let you decide if I did or not. Finally, I reached a trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this rather large forest. It felt like eternity, but I walked the last kilometer to the main square, took off my jumper and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to a station near my car, rather anxiously, I must admit. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in, and drove home. My dog welcomed me like I was coming back from a two-year deployment. Dogs are just amazing. She must have felt that something shook me up. I spent the afternoon contemplating my life in the bathtub. The boots destroyed my feet, but they aren't meant to be sprinted in for large periods of time. I called the forest gamekeeper's office. I inquired about whether they have such cars in service as the one I came across. They do not. Their gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs. Like 99.9% .9 of the time, they are alone. I told them my story and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me that the police wouldn't. No one could have been legally hunting in the area during summer either. I've been keeping up with local news, but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet. I really hope nothing will be reported either. So, gentlemen in the empty forest at lunchtime, let's not meet again. Watching me as I got off, I thanked the bus driver, got off, and realized that the guy was still on the bus. I started walking up the hill to my house like I always do, and I noticed that the bus was still sitting at the stop instead of pulling out and putting on its to terminal sign like it normally did. Weird, sure, but I kept walking. I'd made it about 500 feet. I heard the bus pull out and drive off, and then I heard someone running up behind me. Without even looking back, I knew it was the guy from the bus. 
He was 50 feet behind me at this point. I could hear him having to catch his breath, and he yelled out, Princess, please wait. And of course, I didn't wait. I just kept going. But he didn't stop. He kept yelling, Please, please, princess. I want to make love to you. I have money. Please, I will pay you. I didn't stop walking. I didn't want to make eye contact or acknowledge him, but I'm also walking down a dark street with no cars and no people, and he is hot on my trail but can't keep up with me and seems pretty winded. By the time I made it down the block, he was yelling at the top of his lungs, Princess, Princess, please let me make love to you. I will pay you. Just stop. Princess, please, please and started sobbing, I mean absolutely wailing, all while yelling that he wanted to make love to me and would pay me for it, and calling me princess. He wouldn't stop sobbing, and he was so loud, I'm surprised he didn't wake anyone in the neighborhood up. At this point, he's still 50 feet behind me and crying. I was five blocks from my house, and I didn't want to let the guy know where I lived so I decided to call 911. He kept loudly crying and sobbing and pleading to me. I let the dispatcher know that some guy was following me and propositioning me and crying, and she could hear him sobbing in the background and said a deputy would be there soon. I yelled at the guy. I just called the cops, so leave me the fuck alone. And he just stopped, standing there, still sobbing. I keep walking, but slowly since I'm so close to my house. A couple minutes pass, and there's lights. A sheriff was coming down the street, and when I turned around, the crying guy was nowhere to be found. The officer asked if I wanted him to go look for him, or if I just wanted a ride home. I didn't ever want to deal with that guy again, so I accepted the ride and asked him to just check out the area around my house after he dropped me off, since it's pretty unusual to see an overweight guy in a sweater and slacks wandering around crying at 1.30 a.m. on a weeknight in a residential area. I have no idea if they found him, no idea what would happen if they did find him, since I'm not sure if anything he did was actually illegal or just creepy as hell. Needless to say, I deadbolted my house and stayed up all night talking to a friend in a different time zone until it was morning. So, guy from the bus, let's not meet again. This is a story that's really been bothering me lately for absolutely no reason whatsoever. A few months back, I just had this dream that brought back this memory I tried to suppress growing up. But as of recently, it's been weighing on my mind. Growing up in 2005 on the edge of the suburbs, there was a large grove of trees and hills by some railroad tracks that lead to a big forest about half a mile from my house. When I was nine years old, my neighborhood friend and I would ride our bikes to the railroad tracks and walk to the forest to go explore the random pieces of furniture and junk in this peculiar forest. We'd play card games, do homework, and hang with friends out there for about an hour or two, but we never sat out there too long. There were small abandoned houses here and there in this forest that we stayed away from, as one neighborhood friend, Michael, told me there was a homeless man who lived in one of them, and if you saw him, run. So, right off the bat, after hearing this, going near this house in the woods was scary as could be. One chilly November afternoon, after school, I came home and dropped off my backpack at my house and immediately went to the woods. My bike was broken, so I walked. Michael had told me at school that day, to meet him in this open area of the forest to play Pokemon with him. This was something we'd frequently do growing up, just to pass the time until our parents got home at 4pm, so it was nothing unusual. 
As I crossed the railroad tracks into the forest, I instantly felt a weird sensation, that feeling you feel when someone is watching you. I looked all around and couldn't see anyone, so I thought I was just getting spooked, as the rather overcast day was very eerie anyway. Trekking through the autumn leaves scattered across this large wooded area, I came upon the big open area where I was supposed to meet Michael. Near the area where we normally met was his notebook, open. On the page was written, Hey, I had to go back home and grab some batteries for my Game Boy. Wait for me here. I'll be back soon. Michael. I waited, being alone, especially feeling like someone was watching me, made this particular moment very uncomfortable. However, I convinced myself I was just being a wuss and decided to wait for Michael. I sat down and began playing my Game Boy. It wasn't too long until that sensation of being watched grew into utter paranoia. I kept frantically looking up from my Game Boy and checking my watch to see how long I'd been waiting. I'd been sitting there for 30 minutes. It was beginning to get dark. Then, I heard some leaves crunch. I looked in the direction of the sound and briefly saw a dark hooded figure peeking from behind a few trees, then hide back behind them. My skin crawled and I immediately jumped up from where I was sitting and I froze in my tracks, staring. I screamed, hello, to see if anyone was there. I was quickly reminded I wasn't alone when I saw this tall, dirty looking hooded man peek back around from the trees. He called back, hey buddy. I picked up Michael's notebook and ran for my life. I ran so fast I barely had time to look behind me. However, I heard leaves crunching not too far behind me. It was the man running after me. He was screaming for me to come back and I just wanted to talk to you. I'm sorry. I began crying as I was running, thinking this was exactly how those missing kids disappear. I ran and ran and ran until I literally tripped over the railroad tracks and cut up my knees. Michael was just getting to the railroad tracks. He saw me, dirty and bloody and crying hysterically, and I screamed at him to run. Without question, we ran all the way home. The hooded man was nowhere to be seen once we left the railroad tracks. I last saw him standing in the woods, defeated that he couldn't catch me or something. I don't know. I told Michael everything, and we never went back to the woods ever again. Years later, in 2016, they bulldozed the woods and built a neighborhood there. We later found out from fellow neighborhood friends who were in the area, the same thing happened to them growing up. To this day, this is probably one of my scariest stories growing up. I was around 16 at the time of this happening. Firstly, I'd like to explain what type of person I am, just so my actions make a bit of sense. I'm an average looking girl, a bit overweight, which for my country makes me really undesirable. For this reason, I'm not used to men hitting on me or even considered it a possible occurrence back then. You can say that I'm usually the man in our group, you know, the girl that looks after every other friend when they're drinking, and if a guy's being rude or harassing someone, I'm the one to shut him down. I don't know why I took on this role, probably because my friends are way too naive and nice. Well, I'm like that to strangers when I'm alone. I always try to be helpful to people if they look confused or ask me for directions or anything else. On this particular night, I was going home from school. My high school is in the city center and I take the bus home. Since the buses get overcrowded during peak hours, and I really hate being between crowds of people. I normally wait around 30 minutes to an hour to catch the bus. 
This night, I walked to another bus stop, around five stops before the one to my school, so I can kill time and take an empty bus. It was dark, and I was the only one at that bus stop. I usually don't have a problem with going out alone late at night, as I don't have the men, bad, assault mentality drilled into me. So I'm just minding my own business when this 45 to 50 year old man comes up to me. He has a very friendly face and a smile, so I don't think anything of it. He asks me something, and then I realize he's Turkish. I tell him I don't understand, so he uses basic Bulgarian words he knows, and I somehow understand that he's just asking for directions. Of course, I try my best to explain, and after I feel like he understood, I expect him to just stop talking to me. No, he sat disturbingly close to me and started to talk to me, but again in Turkish. I try to be polite and politely ignore him as best as I can while nodding my head with a smile, looking at the timetable. For some reason, this guy starts asking me for my phone number. At this moment, I realize that this was definitely not a lost foreigner. I try to shut him down, saying I don't have a phone. Don't ask why I thought that was going to work. I finally give in and give him a random number. He says something else to me, again in Turkish, and then the worst happens. All this time, I'm looking at the one minute the bus will be coming in. I'm praying for him to please not try to call the number. Well, he does. And he shows me and asks me why my phone isn't ringing. My stomach flips. I try to think of something fast. Then I remembered that I have my old Motorola in my bag. I usually brought it to school to give to teachers who collected phones during class. I also liked playing games on it. In 2014, that is. Fortunately, the battery was dead. So I just pretended that this is the reason the call isn't going through. I see the guy try to argue, but at this moment, the bus comes and I get on. I sit on the seat behind the driver as always. After 10 minutes, I get this weird feeling. I don't know what it was, but I felt watched. So I look around, but since I'm in the front seat, I can't exactly see everything. Luckily our buses have this gigantic mirror on the inside that shows everybody on the bus. I look into that mirror, and I can clearly see him. He's sitting on the last seat, his leg clearly visible. I start to panic. I'm not sure he's following me, but I'm also a very cautious person, so I can't really ignore this. I start checking for him at every stop, and he's still there. I get paranoid and say fuck it, and I get off the bus. The stop was at our local mall, and luckily it was open until 10pm. I decide to go in, and if he follows, then I'll try to sneak out. He follows alright. You have to understand that in my town, almost nobody goes out after 9pm, so the mall is close to empty. I look around, thinking of ways to disappear, but there's just no way. The mall is an open space. There are three floors, all almost empty. I'd be easily spotted anywhere I go. Now, you'll probably say, you should have asked the security for help. No, in Bulgaria we don't do that. That literally never even went through my mind. The security is just some grandpa that walks around all day. They don't actually do work or anything. If it were today, I might not be as stupid, but back then, this wasn't even an option in my head. And besides, security wasn't even around. So, I do the most logical thing I can do, and I decide to utilize the knowledge I had acquired in the previous week. You see, the mall had a cool corridor system behind the stores. It was completely unmarked by any signs and if you didn't know where you were going, you'd probably get lost. Because it's just endless white corridors that lead to empty rooms for storage or some other stuff. Well, me, being an avid anime fan, loved going around these corridors and pretending I'm a ninja from Naruto on a mission. So, I can proudly say that I learned the right path to the back stairway of the mall. Because I was smart 
and obsessed with the idea of being a spy, I decided to lure this creepy guy into the corridors and then just exit from the back end of the mall. I first entered H&M and pretended to look around just to see if he was really stalking me. He didn't even try to hide it. He stood outside the store, just staring in. I got really scared for a moment, but then I remembered I'm like the best 007 agent out there, so I just continued walking around the mall. I finally entered the corridors, and at this point, I booked it to the staircase. I ran out and then didn't stop running for two bus stops. I tried looking back, but there was no one. So I proudly decided that I was a hero and went home. Today, being a 21-year-old grown-up, I just think about how stupid that is and how I'd probably be 10 times as scared today than I was back then. Well, I hope it never comes to that. I have a lot of creepy things that have happened to me. I might get around to writing the rest. I was 11 when this happened. Anna, my older sister, was 14, and Becky, my younger sister, was 8. My dad was a freelance programmer when I was younger. He made great money on his jobs, but because he was so heavily in debt, 500000 plus, and my mom was not the most gifted person on balancing a budget, we never had much free money available. This meant that we went on a vacation once every few years, and usually that was to a relative's house. My dad had just finished a long project for a big client, and we were celebrating the occasion with a new movie. Final destination, because my dad loved watching scary stuff and scaring the daylights out of my sisters and I. We were in the middle of the movie when the phone rang. He went to get it and came back to grab my mom while we kept watching the movie. Becky took the opportunity to pause the film and take Duchess, our dog, captive because she was scared. They came back about 10 minutes later and announced that we were going to be spending the weekend in a cabin. We didn't know what to make of that, but apparently the client he'd been helping owned a nice cabin by a lake in the mountains and offered to let us lodge there that weekend for a considerably reduced price. It was Thursday so my mom went into a panicked frenzy of packing so we didn't see the rest of the movie that night. After school the next day, we packed up the family van and headed to the mountains. It was a two and a half hour drive, so it was late by the time we got there. We unloaded the van and went exploring in the cabin. It was a ranch style cabin with a little nook thing you could climb up to that was about head height. It was about three feet tall and probably meant for storage, but it was an excellent place for the three of us to hang out in and play games. There were a few dozen board games up there, so we started playing once we decided on the rooms. My mom and dad got the largest one. Anna claimed the smaller one with a twin bed, so Becky and I got the last room which had a queen-sized bed we could share. We had a window on the right side of the bed without a curtain, and a lamp on the left side of the bed. It was the only light source in the room, and there was a closet opposite the bed. It was locked, and we couldn't get in it. I never did figure out what was inside there. We went to bed at around 11. Becky is a kicker, so I slept by the lamp in case she ended up knocking it over. I remember lying down, and I must have instantly fallen asleep, because the next thing I knew... Becky was gripping my arm and trying to burrow under me. She was squeaking something in fright, and I couldn't understand what was happening. I sat up, looked towards her, and I saw something pale and human shape moving away from the window. My sleepy brain took several moments to process that, and then I was shooting out of bed and dragging Becky with me. We rushed to our parents, who told us we were imagining things. My mom told us to go back to bed, and if we saw anything else, to let them know. I, much to my current annoyance, agreed with them and went back into the room with Becky. We switched positions because she refused to go back to bed by the window. 
I told her a story to get her to sleep and promptly conked out after her. I didn't wake up until morning. The next day, we went exploring around the lake for about an hour before my dad decided we'd spend the day in town. They had a lot of small shops and my parents went into every one of them. We ate lunch and dinner in the town and finally went back to the cabin. Anna made a joke about something as we neared the cabin and I remember everybody laughing before my dad suddenly held up his hand to make everyone stop. He took another step towards the cabin and pushed the door open with a single finger. I thought it was strange that the door wasn't latched, but I didn't put the obvious together right away. Dad, Anna said as she shuffled nearer to Bell and I, but my dad gave his head a shake to let her know she needed to be quiet. He went into the cabin and disappeared inside for a minute or two while we stood on the porch. My mom called out his name, and he called back that we could come inside. We did, and found him standing in the middle of the living room slash dining room, with a frown on his face. He locked the door once we were inside, and he took my mom to the bedroom for a quick chat. Anna, having caught on to what was happening, opted to distract Becky and I by suggesting another round of the board game we'd been playing the previous night. We hadn't been playing for more than five minutes when my mom and dad came back. My mom went about cleaning the dishes from breakfast while my dad joined our game. We played for a few hours before dad told us we needed to go to bed. It was only nine at that point, which made Anna mad. She was allowed to stay up until 10.30 on school nights and later on the weekend nights. Becky and I got into bed while they argued. We climbed back into the same spots we slept in, Becky by the window and I by the lamp. I read to Belle for a bit before we drifted off. I woke to my dad rushing into our room. He scooped Becky out of the bed and grabbed my hand. He dragged me out of the room and into the hall where I saw Anna getting similar treatment by my mom. I became aware of a high-pitched whine in the living room and saw our dog sitting at attention by the back door. She was bristled and seemed anxious. My dad didn't put Becky down and didn't let go of my hand. They rushed out of the house and into the van. My dad went back to get our dog, and then he burned rubber getting out of the cabin. He drove all the way back home without saying a word. It took a half hour for Duchess to calm down. He told Anna what happened the next day, but Becky and I didn't find out until years later. He'd woken up that night to what sounded like moaning outside the window in his room. He jumped up and looked to see what was going on, and he found the front door unlocked. Stuff in the kitchen had been moved, and Duchess started to growl at the back door, which was ajar. He locked it and got us out of the house. He went back the next day to get our luggage and found several pairs of footprints outside the window of the room that Belle and I slept in. Alright, so I'll try to keep the backstory as short as possible. A couple years ago, my living situation evaporated faster than I'd expected it to, and I had to pack all my possessions into my car and leave where I was living. There was going to be a short stretch of time where I had next to no money, certainly not enough for a week or two of $80 a night motel fees. I had a little over $100 all in, so I bought a cheap tent and other similarly shitty camping equipment and some ramen and decided I would crash in the woods. That way I could leave my car full of my stuff and still have a place to sleep. I lived in a fairly forested area at the time, and since I grew up in the area and partied out in the woods a lot in high school, I knew a decent amount of trails and discreet hiding places not far from said trails. So I brought my gear out to a very small mountain and, since it was going to rain that night, I hunted around for a nice place to set up. Being a mountain, I couldn't just find high ground, 
but I did find this nice little plateau that projected a few hundred feet from the nearest slope before falling off, and by my best judgment, it seemed as safe a place as any. Well, it turns out my judgment sucks. Not only was the place right in the path of the rain, but all of the water from above had sluiced into an impromptu stream whose course ran right through my tent. I woke up at maybe 2 a.m. to find my sleeping bag half immersed in water and all of my possessions soaked through. Both my phone and flashlight were ruined, so I had no source of light. Despite the lack of illumination, I knew I had to get back to my car because I was freezing cold. Since my clothes were literally soaked through, I decided to leave them and embarked wearing nothing but my boxers. My wallet was ruined too, so I didn't bring it. I quickly realized that I was not going to be able to find the trail, so I went back and took my machete so I could hack through the brush. Now, most of you can probably see where things are going, but I would remind you that you are sitting someplace warm and reasonably safe. If you want to put yourself into my frame of mind, Think of those cold winter days when you go outside and your stream of consciousness transforms from normal thoughts into an endless stream of, oh fuck, and add a bunch of your possessions being ruined into the mix. So I faced the general direction of my car and just started walking, angrily chopping at anything that happened to block my path. Eventually, after much effort, I see an end to the tree line ahead of me. I walk out and realize that I'm in somebody's backyard. Worse, however, is the fact that said backyard has a screened-in porch with a small table lamp and standing on that porch is a woman smoking a cigarette. Now really picture this scene in your head. Imagine a man walking into your backyard half-naked and enraged, swinging a machete around like a madman. The porch lights went off and I immediately went into, I'm definitely going to get arrested, mode. I hustled out to the street and ran towards my car, and I spent the next hour huddled in a ball on the seat, just waiting for the flashing blue lights to come up behind me. They never did, however. I have no idea what that woman thought when she saw me, but it can't have been good. I almost want to go over there and apologize for scaring her but I'm guessing she doesn't want to meet. This was a situation a couple weeks back that left a bad taste in my mouth per se. For context, it might be a bit long, but hopefully it will give a bit of background to what made this encounter so creepy for me. This encounter happened about around the time lockdown was in its prime here in Australia. I'm a 23-year-old female living near Byron Bay, about a 20-minute drive away in the surrounding hinterlands. I was born and raised in the city though, so I like to think my judgement of character is a bit finer developed than country folk. For those not familiar, Byron is a major tourist attraction in northern New South Wales, really close to the Queenland's border. It's a beachside town known for its laid-back lifestyle. Because of this, we get a lot of passerbys, even a bit further out because of the nice views in rich bushland, those kind of reasons. And it's not unusual to meet a few odd people here and there. There's also your dose of strange activity, i.e. backpacker Theo Hayes' disappearance not long ago. Lots of people up here have theories on this, ranging from cults to just straight-up cold-blooded murder. In my suburb, it's still quite rural. On our street, there's about five houses in total, covering a good couple of hundred acres, and at the end of the street, there's a path to a bush to a lovely waterfall. The journey from my property to the beginning of the track is about five minutes, and the path leads to two destinations. The first destination is about five minutes into the track at the top of the waterfall. It has a little wooden platform you can stand on to look out over the waterfall and the stream leading into it. The second is about another five minutes down the track, which is the waterfall itself. Most people keep to the left of the waterfall and will sit under it in the cave, 
as the almost non-existent clearing to the right of it is quite inconvenient and tricky to get to if you aren't planning on getting really wet. This is important for later. I used to go there quite often to write in my journal and clear my head, and my favorite place is just next to the top of the waterfall. I climb through the fence next to the wooden platform and sit next to the stream on the rocky face that covers either side of the stream. The view was the nicest here, and I also liked to sit facing the wooden platform so I could keep better tabs on my environment. This particular day I went down, and coming up to the track, I noticed a camper van parked, with lots of tools and rope attached to the roof. I couldn't see anyone in there, but just had a bit of an inkling there was, so I gave the car a pretty wide berth, social distancing, but also my ever-present paranoia thanks to this and other true crime subs. And as I passed it, I noticed the side door was opened, which quickly slid shut. Straight up, I thought it was pretty fucking weird. It's illegal to set up camp there, and also we're in a period of essential travel only, so I wasn't really expecting to see anyone down there except for a neighbor going for a stroll. However, I passed it off as a tradie wanting to get out of the house into nature for a bit after work or something, and I kept on. I went to my usual riding place, but as we'd had a bout of pretty heavy rain in the few days prior, the stream was full and I wasn't up to crossing it, so I sat on the same side as the wooden platform about 10 to 15 meters away. I wasn't there for long maybe five minutes of riding with my headphones in when I heard something. It sounded like a bird over my music, so I just went back to doing what I was doing. But then a few seconds later, I saw someone out of the corner of my eye coming onto the path. I ignored them and tried to go back to what I was doing, partly because I was in a pretty foul mood and wanted to be left alone but also because it's not really common for anyone to talk to each other out in the bush, apart from the occasional, how you going, passing someone on the track. So I thought maybe they were on the phone. No. He yelled out to me again, which I ignored. And then again. I got the feeling he wasn't going to let up, so I feigned surprise along the lines of, Oh, sorry, I didn't see you and I couldn't hear you over my music. He was in his late 30s to early 40s, just a pretty normal looking guy. The rest of the conversation is hard to recall verbatim, but essentially it went like this. Are you going to jump off the waterfall? He asked. No, I replied. Why not? He proceeded. Because I don't know how deep the water is, I replied. Good answer, he said. It seemed pretty harmless and I assumed he was just visiting the falls for the first time. So I tried to cut off the conversation by going back to my writing. He didn't let up, however, and this is where it started to get a bit weird. I was already feeling quite unsettled by his presence, as he wasn't very focused on the surroundings and more on me, which was pretty strange considering the entire world is in a state of encouraging no communication at the moment. What are you, one of those nature people who likes to come out here by themselves? He asked. No, I told him. What are you doing out here then? He asks. Trying to clear my head and write. It's nice and quiet out here, I replied. Am I bothering you? He asked. Yeah, but it's whatever, I replied to him. Honorable mention to my ADHD for making me always susceptible to saying the wrong thing and pretty much incapable of lying. There was just a bit of lull here, both of us just kind of sizing each other up, I guess. Me, just really wanting him to fuck off, but also not being too worried if he did try anything, as I had a large stick with me. It was still pretty warm out, so I always carry it with me because of snakes. How did you get here? He asked. I just climbed down off the path through the fence, I told him. No. I mean, how did you get here, to this place? He pushed. I walked, I replied. Pretty long walk to be out here by yourself, he commented. Not really, I just live up the road, I countered. Something about that response changed something in his behavior, 
but as we were pretty far apart, it was a bit hard to figure out what. Regardless, I wasn't vibing the situation at all, and I was also kicking myself for making it glaringly obvious to some random guy that I was out here alone, and also for not having told my family where I was going. Uh, well, I guess I'll leave you to your writing. This calmed me a lot, and once again just passed him off as a passerby. I then tell him, the view's a lot nicer under the waterfall if you follow the path down. Oh, I don't know if I could go alone. There could be some people down there waiting to mug me. You'd have to come with me. He says, who says shit like this, especially to someone you've just met in the middle of nowhere? No, probably just having a picnic or a swim, I returned. He stood there for a bit longer than I would have liked looking at me and then finally left me alone with an, all right, see you later, as he headed back up the path toward the parking lot, and I assumed he was going home. I still felt a bit uneasy, so I turned off my music completely and tried to go back to writing. Some time passed, but I was struggling to concentrate, but it wasn't my usual restlessness. I just felt so uncomfortable, almost exposed, so I took a break to enjoy the scenery, and I looked down at the bottom of the waterfall, and this guy is standing to the right of it, and that's exactly what he was doing, just standing there, staring at me. I thought I was just overthinking it, but no, I could literally feel his eyes on me. I noped the fuck out of there. Even if he was just a creepy guy with innocent enough intentions, I wasn't going to wait around to find out and I'd have a five minute head start if he did try to follow me, so I ran back home, and what was left of my journal entry for that day was essentially just about that weird ass guy. I waited to hear his car go by as well, but it didn't. I thought that was weird. I assumed he must have set up camp there or whatever, or just left later that night. Either way, it sufficiently creeped me out and ruined that spot for me. I haven't been back since. Thanks for listening, and stay safe out there, everyone. The House in the Cornfield The snowy hill was filled with children and parents alike, all sledding blissfully, utilizing the first snow day of the year. Jacob had never experienced snow like this before, at least in any way as memorable as this. Jacob had moved from South Carolina. Quite the cultural difference, sure, but still being in middle school, he wasn't exactly partial to the South. The snow was fresh and still falling at a considerable rate that you could expect the next couple of days off from school. It was an early snowfall, at least for Davis County. The clear hill was quite dense with all ages of people enjoying the first snowfall, as if snow itself rendered everyone the same age and maturity. It didn't take long for Jacob to find his handful of friends he had made since the beginning of the school year. Since Jacob's parents were separated and his mother would be working all day, he knew that he had virtually no curfew. After spending a good portion of the day, the hill slowly diminished of people. The bareness of the hill made the once fun and exciting place to be more somber and isolating. The woods that surrounded both sides seemed to become darker. Despite Jacob being with his friends, he now became aware of the time, not that he needed to get back, but that the shadows of the woods began to creep across the hill. The sun was still up and would be for the next couple of hours, but Jacob and his friends quickly realized that they were the last ones on the hill. Stories of kidnappers and gruesome serial killers that frequented the dark woods surrounding them caused their snow day to become short. If anything were to happen to these boys, no one would know about it for quite some time. It's getting kind of late. I'm soaking wet, Ethan said while glancing around the empty hill. Same time tomorrow? Assuming that school is still canceled. Jacob nodded his head. He was glad someone said something since he didn't want to be the first to end such a great time. 
The small group of boys did one last run before all meeting up at the bottom of the hill and going their separate ways. Ethan and his brother Jason went their separate ways from the rest of the boys since they lived on the other side of town. Jacob, Gary, and Trevor began the cold walk alongside the woods, which bordered some kind of abandoned cornfield of some kind. After five minutes of walking, Trevor pitched the idea that there was a shortcut in the cornfield that would take about 15 minutes off their walk back to the main road. Jacob had seen the cornfield when he was walking to the hill earlier that day. The brown and black stalks of corn stood at a height that made visibility quite difficult, especially at their preteen sizes. But thankfully, the field was clearly not taken care of. The once perfect field of road corn was now slowly losing the crop that once grew here. Getting lost in the field was possible, but not likely. Trevor and Gary began pushing their way through the dying crop when they looked back to see Jacob. He was clearly not comfortable with the idea. Are we allowed to go in the cornfield? Doesn't someone own this? Gary began to chuckle. Does it look like anyone owns it? It looks terrible. Jacob was unconvinced. What if we get lost in there? Then we'll really be in trouble. Trevor piped in. We won't get lost. I've done this before. There's a path in here somewhere that leads you to the other side by the road. You don't have to come, but you will have to walk back by yourself. Up to you. The two boys continued walking slowly, out of view of Jacob. The woods behind him were menacing, especially so since he was slowly becoming more alone by the second. The irrational thoughts would quickly triumph over reason as Jacob quickly found himself chasing after his friends in the cornfield. Thankfully, he didn't have to go too far to find them. Worst case scenario, he could simply follow the footprints in the snow to find them, but he didn't have to. The young boys chuckled through their wet scarves as they knew Jacob was too afraid to be alone. The three continued together trudging through the snow and toppled cornstalks that filled the field. About halfway through the field, a small clearing emerged, revealing to the surprise of all the young boys an old and decrepit two-story home quietly gathering snow. Whoa, this wasn't here before, Trevor mumbled. Trevor was telling the truth when he had said he had crossed the field many times, but in none of his instances of taking the shortcut had he ever come across the home. Gary and Jacob were silent. Taking in the hideous form that neglect inflicted upon the exterior wood of the house, the clearing wasn't terribly large just enough to imprison the strange structure within it. It was a home for sure, but there was no road or path leading to this bizarre destination, and the building itself emitted no light, only darkness. Thick clouds of snow began to swell in the sky, shading the dimming sun even more so. The three boys silently agreed that this might have been something fun to investigate, perhaps with an older brother or on a warm summer day, but right now, this place was dreadful, a place that surely must have held terrors and pain, a serial killer's hideout, no doubt. None of the boys even suggested entering. The excuse of being late in the day or being too cold didn't even have to arise as they all walked past the house. They continued into the field, seeing how that for once the idea of them no longer being alone began to fester in their young minds. They had a couple of hours of daylight left, so panic didn't initially find them when they were not able to find the other side of the field. The stalks were too tall, shrouding any possibility of peering over to find a hint out of this unintended maze. Rather than fear or anxiety, frustration kept the boys company as they wandered aimlessly in the cornfield. The shortcut, which should have taken maybe 10 minutes in its entirety, was now almost an hour in effectively removing this path from the title of being a shortcut. Thankfully, the boys were smart, at least when it came to problem solving. I suppose they weren't that smart seeing how they put themselves in this situation. But nonetheless, they realized that all they had to do was backtrack by following their snow prints, and they would have found the way that they came into the field. But time and weather were against them. Snow continued to fall, slowly filling the shoe prints that would guide them out of there. The boys stopped guessing their way back and turned back. The snow prints weren't easy to follow. The uneven ground and the fallen stalks of corn made tracking their path not the easiest, 
but definitely possible. A brisk 15 minutes passed and the boys found themselves back at the house. Following their footprints and trying to hurry had greatly minimized the time needed. But as fate would have it, the young boys were not able to find their initial trail leading to the house. Again, there was no rush in regards to daylight, but the idea that they were lost began to slowly dawn on them, causing them to resort to an unpleasant reality. All they needed to know was which direction they needed to take to get them out the fastest. If they could only just simply glance over the stalks of corn, they would know in a matter of seconds. But the only way for them to do that was if they entered the house of horrors, if you will, go to the second story and glance out the window. Now this was obviously easier said than done. The thought of someone still living inside seemed unlikely, due purely to the house's condition. But that didn't mean a hobo or some desperate animal didn't take this structure as its new home. The three considered drawing straws, but that idea was pointless seeing how whoever was going to go inside would be too scared to do so alone. The boys realized that if they wanted to get out of this field, then they would all need to go inside to do so. The front of the house looked empty. The bottom level windows had been boarded and what remained of the front door appeared to be chained. A sigh of relief came across the boys, as they could say with the probability that no one was inside. But this did make their plan more difficult seeing how they needed a way in. The boys quickly circled the house. Gary, who was on the back side, shouted, Guys, come here. I think I have something. Jacob and Trevor quickly sprinted and saw Gary trying to lift a storm cellar door, but was struggling with the weight. A heavy chunk of ice and snow made the door three times as heavy. With the help of the other boys, they were able to open the door and peer inside. A dark set of stairs led them into a dark basement. The three looked at each other as they slowly went inside. Thankfully, the stairs didn't go too deep, but the sun was on the wrong side of the house to properly illuminate the basement fully. Inside the basement was a treasure trove of junk and other miscellaneous items that served no real purpose but to young boys. This was a jackpot. Old farming equipment laid on the floor and sides of the walls while a particular item laid in a cleared area in front of a strange metal door. Gary and Trevor were preoccupied with picking out what they wanted to take that they didn't notice Jacob walking over to the metal door. The metal door looked as if it didn't belong in the house. If anything, it looked like a bank vault but that's not what caught Jacob's attention. Laying in front of the door, as if it was watching it, was a skull. Not any ordinary skull, but one with twisted and dark bone. It didn't appear to be human, at least to Jacob, but surely this was some kind of creature he was unfamiliar with. He was drawn to it mainly out of morbid curiosity. He went to pick up the item, and once he touched it, his vision went black. A disembodied demon voice spoke to him. A wretched soul touches the totem. His vision was now filled with horrors and pain. People screaming from torture and violence. A gathering in the woods of strange people wearing masks, chanting and sacrificing poor victims to a strange and dark god of the woods. A vision of a dark entity looking upon his soul with no barrier of concealment. You are now cursed with the totem. What felt like a thousand years of torment and agony ended up being only a few moments as Jacob was brought back to reality. Neither Gary nor Trevor had realized what had happened. They were too busy scavenging through garbage until Jacob came to and began to vomit violently. Sludge of black filth escaped his body, causing the other two boys to forget what they were doing and gave attention to Jacob, who was now on his hands and knees dry heaving what little vomit remained. You okay, bro? Trevor said worriedly. No, I'm not. Something's not right. Before Jacob explained what had happened, Gary saw the metal door ahead of them. Whoa, this looks like a safe door or something. There's probably some treasure behind it. Jacob stood to his feet. Don't touch the door. He was exhausted. He was no longer subjected to the cold of the snow, but was now sweating from every pore. Dude, what are you holding? The thing looked scary. Jacob looked down to see he was holding the totem skull by its antler. 
Before he could get a word out, a loud slam came from the other side of the door, and a scream. The scream shook the boys except for Jacob, who was still coming to terms with what he had just experienced. The door shook its frame as rapid banging began to twist and mangle its shape. Something strong was behind it. The boys made their way out of the basement, up the stairs, and up to the second floor. Panic controlled their bodies, but they still remembered to look over the cornfield to find their way out. After a quick glance, the three then saw the direction they needed to go and began to lift the old window. Whatever was behind the door in the basement had gotten out. A loud slam of the metal door landing flat on the concrete floor told the boys they only had a couple of seconds before whatever it was that was being detained had gotten out. The boys got the old window to budge, but not enough. Thinking quickly on his feet, Gary grabbed a drawer from a fallen dresser that was sitting in the rim and threw it out the window, shattering the glass and the frame that held it together. The thing was now out of the basement and on the main floor. None of the boys had time to think about jumping out the window, but just did it. The snow and the stalks of corn provided little cushion to their fall, but the adrenaline in their bodies made up for the damages. They sprinted into the cornfield. After 10 minutes, they finally escaped and made it to the other side. Neither of them were sure what was in the basement, nor if it followed them out, but they didn't wait around to find out. It wasn't until Jacob had a moment to breathe that he realized he was still holding on to the totem. He thought he left the cursed item in the basement with whatever hell-like creature was in there, but he was still grasping it tightly. The boys continued to run down the street to a more populated part of the town. From there, they began to feel safe. The boys took a moment to recall what had happened, and they all agreed on what they experienced. It was clearly that they had nearly escaped some terrible fate. They didn't get a good look at whatever it was, but that didn't mean it didn't see them. Gary and Trevor began walking towards their street, and Jacob went his own way home. Vomit on his winter jacket had covered the front of his clothes and began to harden from the cold. The sun which the boys had taken advantage of had now began to set. The traumatic experience made it so that Jacob never wanted to see this totem again, but any thought he had of throwing it away into the woods would cause a voice to speak in his head. You cannot relieve yourself of such a fate. You are bound to the totem. Jacob continued his way home and found his mother was still at work. Unsure of what to do with the totem, Jacob placed it under his bed and took a shower. Jacob woke up the next morning to his alarm clock. His last memory was him taking a shower, but he didn't remember leaving. Not only that, but he didn't remember having dinner or even going to bed. But the strange thing about all this was that he did remember his dream from last night. Normally, Jacob, for the life of him, could not remember his dreams. But from the night prior, was totally different. He dreamt he had walked home with Gary and Trevor, except they didn't make it home. Something had grabbed them, dragged the two back into the cornfield and into the basement of the house. Jacob was covered in sweat as he rubbed his face. He glanced around the room to see if the totem was there or even real, but thankfully, he was not able to find it. It was five or so in the morning. His mother should have been home, but was probably still asleep. Jacob went to check the news on the TV to see if school was still canceled, but the newscaster was talking about sports from over the weekend. Jacob was about to make himself a bowl of cereal, but realized he wasn't hungry. Not only that, but thinking about eating anything other than meat made him nauseous. About an hour later, around six or so, the news finally covered the school districts that were closed. Davis County was open. Dang, this was frustrating, as no kid wanted to go to school on a perfectly good snow day. But Jacob wasn't opposed to getting some social interaction. The thought of him going back to the hill or even near that cornfield was too much. It would cause him to panic and get anxious unlike anything he had ever felt before. His mother entered the living room, rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. You have school today, bud? Jacob nodded. Aw, that's too bad. Give me a minute and I'll give you a ride. Jacob was quiet the entire morning. Normally, he would interact with most kids or would answer the teacher's questions, but he was filled with anger and malice. It was around third period when something strange occurred. 
Two policemen entered the classroom with Principal Roberts and asked to speak to Jacob. Jacob shot up out of his desk and walked over to the three men. He knew it must have been about entering that home and probably stealing things that didn't belong to them. The four of them walked to the principal's office and Jacob was about to confess when the officers asked about Gary and Trevor. Jacob was stunned, but was also silent. Apparently, neither boy made it home yesterday. Jacob saw the officer's badge with the name Wilkins on it. Now the parents tell us that you're good friends with both the boys. I'm guess that you were with them sledding on that hill like every other child. Did anything strange happen? Jacob was afraid. Jacob shook his head and was about to lie when he blurted out, We went into the cornfield and something chased us out of there. Both officers were stunned and began writing down on their notepads. Surprisingly, neither officer was angry but rather understanding and supportive. Okay, well, thank you for your honesty. Tell us what happened. Jacob began to tell the officers what had happened, but when he mentioned the house, both officers had a look of confusion. Wait, there's a house in that cornfield? You sure? It wasn't a shed or anything? No, it was a house. We had to go inside to see which direction we needed to go to get out of that field. The officers continued riding. Are we talking about the same sledding hill? The one on the other side of town? I'm not sure, said Jacob. I'm new here. I don't know of any other hill in town. Well, the reason we ask is that that specific cornfield had been abandoned since the 80s. There was a farm there, but it burned down. Now the reason we're worried is because the officer stopped. You know what? Forget it. Thanks for your honesty. You may go. Jacob was not able to focus the rest of the day. Both his friends were missing and he had a sickening feeling that he had something to do with it. However, he was thankful. The voices in his head and the totem were no longer around. The day dragged on and school eventually let out. On the way home, he couldn't stop thinking about what the officer was trying to say before he had stopped himself. What was he going to say? The bus arrived on his street and he got off. His body was sore from yesterday, but the cold air took his mind off of it. Jacob reached the driveway to his house when he had noticed the front door to his house it was open. His mother's car was not in the driveway, so this concerned him. Jacob had no cell phone, so calling the police would require him to go to a neighbor's house, or to go inside. With how everything was recently, with not only this encounter from yesterday, but his friends going missing, he decided to ask his neighbors. Thankfully, Mrs. Wilson was home. Jacob called the police and told them that someone had broken into his house. Surprisingly enough, the same two officers from the school happened to arrive at his house. Jacob, right? Officer Wilkins said. We checked out that cornfield earlier today. Couldn't find anything. Jacob was silent. So, what's going on here? Someone broke in? Jacob nodded. Well, that was smart of you to call us rather than entering your own home. Can't be too careful. Hang tight while we go inside. Both officers drew their weapons and entered the home. Jacob waited outside by their cruiser, unsure of who or what they would find. To his surprise, the officers were not quick. In fact, other officers arrived on the scene before he saw those two again. Eventually, Jacob's mother caught wind that the police were at her house and left work early. The original officers eventually came out some time later and requested both the mother and Jacob come with them down to the station for questioning. Jacob's mother was not pleased by this. Why do you need us to go to the station? What's going on here? The officers tried to calm her down, but to no avail. Something happened inside, and you guys are no longer safe here. We need you to come back to the station, and from there we can brief you on what's going on. Jacob and his mother finally agreed, and drove down to the station with the officers. It was dark out, roughly 8 o'clock. The snow began to pick up again. Once inside the station, police finally shared what they had found inside. Firstly, the house itself was destroyed, as if someone purposely vandalized the house, but also in a way that someone was looking for something. But that wasn't the concerning part. In Jacob's room, the police found a decapitated deer, and blood smeared all over the room. Etched into the deer were three words. 
return the totem. No one knew what it meant except for Jacob. His eyes went wide as fear struck him, paralyzed. What does this mean, Jacob? His mother cried. I... I saw something yesterday. I didn't think it had value, but I might have found something that was evil. The officers began writing again, and the mother stared at him with a look of shock. What are you talking about? I thought you went sledding yesterday. We were, but afterwards we found a house in the cornfield. Inside were all these strange items, and I touched something I shouldn't have. But I haven't seen it since yesterday. I don't know where it is now. Before anyone could say anything, Officer Wilkins spoke up. I think we found it at the scene. Is this what they were after? Officer Wilkins bent down and picked up a box with evidence tape on it. Inside was a skull totem. The item alone made Jacob's worried mother burst into tears. What have you gotten yourself into? She cried. The other officers removed the mother from the room, and Jacob and Wilkins remained. We think that if you return this item to the house in that cornfield, whoever had kidnapped your friends will release them. Now we can't be sure that's what we have to do, but would you at least be willing to show us where this house is? Jacob felt sick. The idea of going anywhere near that cornfield riddled his body full of anxiety. But he thought about his friends, how scared they must have been, how cold and hungry they were, that is, if they were still alive. I'll do it. I'll show you where it is on one condition. If I show you that house, you'll have to help me put back the totem and fight whatever took my friends. Officer Wilkins agreed. Wilkins, his partner, Officer Taylor, and Jacob drove from the station back to the hill. It was much later now. The moon provided some light, but clouds were thick. Jacob sat in the back of the cruiser with the box holding the totem. He could almost hear it speaking to him. Open the box. Take me out. I can make you immortal. The whisperings were getting to him, but luckily they finally arrived to the field. The field was dark. Both officers put on protective gear and mounted flashlights on their rifles. But they didn't call him back. Taking a young boy to a potential kidnapper's house in the middle of nowhere was completely against regulation. But they were desperate at this point. This was a time-sensitive situation. If they were lucky, they would be able to save the other two boys and take down the sick freak that would have for sure killed them. Jacob exited the cruiser holding the box. His breath warmed his face as the bitter night air howled in the distance. Jacob was afraid. Even though he had two highly trained officers with him, he still feared for his safety and that of his friends. All right, kid, you're on point. Lead us to this freak's house and we'll save your friends. Jacob led the officers into the field. The field and the corn stalks were bigger than he remembered. The dark night definitely didn't help. As the three pushed their way through, both officers made sure to break as many stalks as they could, clearing a path out for them to get out quickly, if needed. Jacob began to shiver, not from the cold air, but that he knew he was going to slowly reach the place he swore he'd never go to again. From behind, Officer Taylor exclaimed, Oh my gosh, there it is. He shined his light up ahead, and sure enough, the phantom house appeared in the field. This can't be. We searched this field for hours today. This was not here before. Something's wrong. Officer Taylor began to panic. There's something off about this. This is more than just a house. This is something much worse. I can feel it. Jacob and Wilkins looked back, seeing how Officer Taylor was now having a panic attack. I can't do this. This place will kill us, all of us. Wilkins pulled him aside. What are you doing? You and I have been through way worse. We need to get it together. The kid's fine, and he was the one before without any weapons. You need to push through for me. Do it for the kids that are inside. But Taylor just froze, completely petrified, as if his mind knew of the evil that lurked within. After a few minutes, Wilkins and Jacob continued on. Well, it looks like it's just you and me, kid. Let's go find your friends. Jacob took him over to the storm cellar door that he and his friends had found the other day. The door was still open. Okay, I'm going to lead the way and you stay behind me. Don't say or do anything that will give away our position. 
Jacob nodded. The two entered slowly, as if time itself slowed. The light on the rifle pierced into the darkness, illuminating the basement. The box holding the totem began to vibrate. We're getting close, Jacob whispered. A search of the basement revealed to the officer and Jacob that there was indeed something down there, but not at the moment. The basement was clear, but a soft crying could be heard upstairs. They're upstairs, Wilkins whispered as he found the stairs leading up and led the way. The cry became louder the higher they went up. It sounded as if at least one of the boys was still alive, but Jacob was unsure which of his friends it was. The box vibrated more as if a rabid animal was trying to escape from within. The box is shaking on its own. I'm not doing this, Jacob assured. We need to get this guy in now. You stay on the main floor and I'll take care of him. Wilkins then rushed up the stairs and barged into one of the rooms on the second floor. Stop, please, hands up, Wilkins shouted. Multiple screams could be heard. His friends were alive. Jacob looked up the stairs intently, trying to see what was going on, but it was too dark. Gunshots could be heard in a loud bang. He's killing him, the box whispered. You can still save him. Take me to the beast. Jacob was no longer in control of his body. His thoughts were consumed by hunger and pain. He knew what was up there, what was waiting for him in the darkness. His instincts were telling him to run. Drop the box and run as fast as you can, but he was now being commanded by the totem. Jacob walked up the stairs slowly, screaming and banging continued. He ascended the stairs and saw the light shine from the next room, as Wilkins' gun laid on the floor. Jacob entered the room to see a pale, skinny man standing over Wilkins. The man had blood on his mouth and hands as Wilkins laid lifeless on the ground. The box shook so much that Jacob dropped it and the totem rolled on the floor. The creature stopped and looked at Jacob. This man was tall. His body hardly looked human. He looked as if people evolved to be killing machines. He can't be killed, screamed Gary. Jacob then felt immense pain shoot throughout his body. The man went to pick up the twisted skull totem, but when he did, it burned him. He dropped it and Jacob fell to the ground. Visions began to fill his mind as his two friends looked on in horror. Jacob's limbs began to grow and snap, twisting and elongating much like the man that took the boys. After a few painful seconds, Jacob looked almost identical to the demon man that stood before them. Officer Wilkins began to come too, seeing that they were now two beasts in the room. He went to reach for his rifle, but the boys told him to stop. Jacob then stood towering over the much smaller window. The two beasts began to fight as the boys grabbed the officer and left the room. Screams from both could be heard as they left the house and found the path that Wilkins and Taylor made for them to escape. The three of them continued to hear screams until it was abruptly stopped. None of them waited to see who had won the battle of the beasts. Siren lights could be seen through the stalks as Wilkins realized Taylor had called him back up. Dozens of cruisers sat outside the field, with men ready to enter but this would be pointless. As Officer Wilkins knew that without Jacob, they would never find that house. The summer of 1997, I was nine and scared of my own shadow, so this experience only furthered my fear of the world. My mom and I drove up from Revere, Massachusetts, to Bear Brook State Park in New Hampshire to camp. My dad was going to drive up the next morning to meet us because he had work. So, everything was going normal at the campsite. We set up the tent, built our fire, all was well. It was still daylight when we noticed that the lone greasy-haired man in the campsite connected to ours was continually running and leaping onto a wooden post then attempting to balance himself on one foot. He kept doing this over and over and over. It was odd, but we just figured he was some lonely kook, and we had a good laugh at his expense. My mom thought maybe he was trying out for the circus. Cut to nighttime, absolute darkness if not for the campfire. 
My mom and I were sitting and roasting s'mores over the flames when we heard footsteps approaching from the other campsite. Out of the pines, the lone man stumbled onto our campsite, and he was ghastly and ragged in the firelight. I could tell my mom was tense. She asked the stranger what he needed. Hey, he mumbled, I need your help in my campsite. We waited, and he didn't go. My mom asked what he needed help with. The filthy man said, I locked my keys in my van. I need you to come over and help me. He then looked at me and said, Don't worry, kid. You can stay here with your fire. I remember getting goosebumps at that. My mom said, I don't know how I can help you with your lost keys. You must have a spare hanger lying around somewhere, suggested the man. My mom told him that she didn't. The ghoulish man wouldn't let up though. Yeah, you must have a hanger lying around here somewhere. Maybe you dropped one on the ground near your tent. My mom adamantly told him she did not have a hanger and quickly added, My husband will be here soon. Maybe he can help you. He's a pretty strong guy. Yeah, alright. The creep slurred and he started to trudge away into the dark, but he turned his head and said, Well, if you do find a hanger, come help me, I'll be here. And with that, the horrible man left. My mom and I barely slept that night. I felt her moving at every sound outside the tent. Looking back, my poor mother must have stayed up through the long night, worrying a butcher knife was going to slash through the tent wall. And so, morning eventually came, and when we stepped out of the tent, we immediately saw that the lone man and his camper van were gone. Later that day, I heard my mom exclaim. I ran over to her and watched as she picked something up from the ground beside our tent. She held it between us, staring at it, not speaking. It was a metal hanger. I found out later in life that four dead females were found stuffed into metal barrels in Bear Brook State Park back in the 80s. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Trevor Blockley, Cassandra Bricker-Wyatt, Paddy's niece, Adiara Yasharala L. Deb Foster, Kathleen Greer, Lynn Meese, Ryan, Chris Lawson, Joe Jordan, Lise Mendoza, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, The Tijara, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, Jennifer Chamberlain, Denise Watson, Zero Bite, Erica Asir, Forgotten Ruins TV, Night Shadow, Healing with Ev, Talisha Kluss, Donna Cox, Holy Crusader, Sheila Grant 44, Julie Hibbins, Stephanie McLaren, Janet Mills Rice, Bob Jeff, Master Dom Howie, Denise Watson, Roz, Cassandra Wyatt, Travis Smith, Zoe D, Kat Philbin, Melissa Friesen, Lorna Clark, Kathy Richmond, Natasha Hensley, Jaleesa Ferguson, Leah McBride, Emily Pearson, Tyler Wilson, Lynn Meese, Kristen Birdo, Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruist, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, 
Monica Levales, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Matt is a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sara Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zeferano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.